just to introduce, I'm Fiona Scolding, um, Queen's Council. I am a member of Landmark Chambers Public Law Team. I am chairing this seminar this afternoon. We have three speakers who are speaking to us about a variety of topics, all of which are very interesting. First, um, Admas, who is um, a member of the Public Law Team, is going to speak to us about um, an update on asylum and immigration cases, including a recent decision about the use of evidence in torture claims, a question, um, an issue around when one can rely upon or not rely upon the assurances of a foreign government as to the conditions in their prison, and further updates as to when one can claim derivative refugee status. Following on from that, we have Alex Shattock, who is going to talk to us about machine learning, i.e. not having individuals making decisions, but having um, computers using algorithms making decisions about asylum and immigration, something which I understand the Home Office is currently investigating. And last but by no means least, we will be hearing from Chris Jacobs about Article 31 of the Refugee Convention, which um, in effect indicates that one shouldn't be refused a right to settle in another country simply um, if one has criminal offences, shall we say, related to unlawful entry into that country and how that works out in the UK for those who may have been prosecuted for illegal entry into the country at various points in time who are then refused a right to remain or to settle at a later date. Um, please do um, put questions into the chat function. I can see very many of you are already using it. But without any further ado, uh, if I could pass over to Admas. Thank you very much, uh, Fiona. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm going to be doing an asylum and ECHR case law uh, update. Um, I've, at the start of the presentation, I've outlined some themes that emerged from um, case law over the past 12 months or so um, in the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court uh, in particular. Um, some of the questions that have been tackled um, uh, in those cases, um, is it possible to obtain refugee status deriv derivative derivatively through a parent, the scope of expert medical evidence on torture, um, displacing assurances given by state officials in relation to Article 3 prison conditions, um, an important case on internal relocation in Afghanistan and uh, another important case on whether internal re relocation can be used as a basis for um, secession of refugee status. Uh, we've had a couple of um, uh, important cases on Dublin 3 and also uh, an, an, a Court of Appeal decision on academic claims. Um, in the time that I have, I'm not going to be able to cover um, all of those um, themes in depth. So I'm going to focus on three cases that are particularly of interest, which deal with the fir first three themes that I've set out there. And I've got a list of the cases that deal with the other issues at the end that you'll be able to refer to later. And if there's time permitting, I'll, I'll try to go on to those two. So the first case um, that I'm going to uh, be looking at is JS Uganda, which was a decision of the uh, Court of Appeal of October last year. Um, and this is uh, the case that deals with the question of whether or not um, an applicant can derive derivative refugee status through their relationship with their parent. Um, and just to give you the answer to that question at the outset, the answer is no, you cannot. So let's have a look at JS Uganda and how it is the Court of Appeal came to that conclusion. So JS was recognised as a refugee um, under the Home Officer's family reunion policy on the basis that his mother uh, was a refugee. She satisfied the definition uh, of a refugee under the Refugee Convention and on the basis of that policy, um, JS was also recognised as a refugee. Um, once uh, the Secretary of State took the view that the circumstances in Uganda had uh, changed such that um, JS's mother would not have been entitled refugee status anymore and on that basis decided to cease um, JS's status um, under Article 1c5 of the Refugee Convention. Um, that article 
provides that the protection of the convention will cease to apply where the refugee can no longer, because the circumstances in connection with which he has been recognised as a refugee have ceased to exist, continue to refuse to avail himself or herself of the protection of the country of his nationality. So in essence, the circumstances have changed and your claim to refugee status um, is no longer uh, made out. So that was the basis on which the Secretary of State um, ceased JS's status. JS appealed against um, that decision. Uh, his appeal was refused. The upper tribunal, and then JS appealed against the upper tribunal. The upper tribunal allowed the appeal, and the basis on which it did that was on a particular interpretation of Article 1C5. It said that that did not apply to JS's case because the circumstances in which he had been recognised as a refugee were that he was the son of a recognised refugee. His mother was still a recognised refugee, therefore his circumstances hadn't changed. Uh, and on that basis, uh, his appeal was allowed against the secession decision. The Secretary of State um, thereupon appealed to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal allowed the Secretary of State's appeal and it held that the status of refugee was only accorded to a person who themselves had a well-founded fear of persecution. You couldn't piggyback off the fact that somebody else, your parent or some other person, um, satisfied that substantive criteria. You as the applicant had to satisfy that criteria yourself. It followed, therefore, that the acceptance um, of JS under the family union policy, the Home Office family union policy, did not amount to recognition as a refugee. It did not lead to an acquisition of status as a refugee under the Refugee Convention. And it also followed that JS, um, excuse me, I should say JS, had never been recognised as a refugee under the Convention. So that was dispositive of the appeal. Um, the Court of Appeal went on to consider the interpretation of Article 1C5 that the Upper Tribunal had adopted. Um, and it found that the Upper Tribunal had erred in that interpretation also, um, because even if um, JS had been able to obtain status through his mother, the Court of Appeal said, the circumstances, uh, the word circumstances in Article 1C5 were broader than understood by the upper tribunal and they did extend to the basis on which the mother had sought refugee status. So where that changed, it was perfectly permissible to say that the circumstances uh, no longer obtained. And so that's a um, clarification there from the Court of Appeal as to the scope of Article 1C5. The case also um, deals with a um, interesting, potentially um, uh, useful uh, procedural point, which arose. Um, JS had been granted leave to enter as if he were a refugee. And also in pre-action correspondence and in the litigation below, the Secretary of State had proceeded on the basis that JS was indeed a refugee. That's how um, he was being described. It was only at the Court of Appeal that the Secretary of State sought to reverse the position and argue that actually JS um, was not a refugee. And um, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, JS argued that this should not be permitted and that the Secretary of State should be held to the concession in the normal way um, that JS was a refugee. Uh, the Court of Appeal came down on the Secretary of State side on this issue also. It allowed the Secretary of State to withdraw the concession and its reasoning on that point is set out at paragraph um, 89. It's an interesting uh, example of um, the application of, of, of the relevant principles. Uh, the Court of Appeal set out four reasons basically why they thought it was proper to allow the Secretary of State to withdraw that concession. Um, first of all, there was no evidence that the issue had actually been considered specifically um, by the Home Office's officials. Secondly, 
the point was a difficult one, as had been noted by the uh, by Lord Justice Irwin in granting permission to the Court of Appeal, and as such, the Court of the view that some leeway should be permitted on that basis. It wasn't an obvious point. Thirdly, the point was a pure point of law and didn't require any fresh evidence. And fourthly, the court took the view that there was no material prejudice to JS in allowing the point to be taken on appeal. So that's JS Uganda. So moving on now to the second of um, the cases that I'm, I'm going to discuss, it's um, a case called KV Sri Lanka, a Supreme Court decision in which um, Richard Drabble QC of this chambers was for the uh, uh, appellant, original claimant. This was an appeal against the, um, well, the original appeal was against the refusal of an asylum claim. Um, the uh, claimant uh, was a Sri Lankan national who alleged that he had been tortured by the Sri Lankan authorities. And um, this, the, the relevance of this case is um, in highlighting um, in what the Supreme Court says about the role of uh, medical evidence, uh, expert evidence on um, injuries said to be sustained by torture. So before the upper tribunal, the medical expert gave evidence, excuse me. Gave evidence that the appearance of scars on the claimant's right arm were highly consistent with the claimant's account of how he had been tortured, uh, which was that hot metal rods had been applied to his right arm while he was conscious and then applied to his back while he was unconscious. And the uh, terminology of highly consistent is a reference to paragraph 187C of the Istanbul Protocol. And within that um, spectrum, it, it indicates that the lesion could have been caused by the trauma described and that there are a few other possible causes. Despite that evidence, the upper tribunal dismissed the claimant's appeal. And it found that his scar, it found as a matter of fact, that his scars had been inflicted by someone at his own invitation. KV appealed to the uh, Court of Appeal, and the Court of Appeal said this about the um, evidence of the expert. It said that by stating the scars were highly consistent with the claimant's account, rather than simply saying that the scars were highly consistent with the mechanism by which they were said to have been caused that is the method uh, uh, of torture that was described. In doing that, the expert had trespassed beyond his remit into the area where it was for the upper tribunal to make an assessment of all the evidence. So the court of appeal is saying that it's for the expert to say, does the um, physical evidence match up to the mechanism described? And then it's for the tribunal to uh, line that up against the claimant's account. And then in, in taking the approach that the expert did, he went beyond his remit. KV appealed to the Supreme Court and was successful. The Supreme Court allowed the appeal and um, essentially concluded that the Court of Appeal uh, was wrong uh, uh, on that specific point. The Supreme Court said that when analysing whether scars had been um, established to be the result of torture, um, it was perfectly legitimate for decision makers to receive assistance, um, which is often valuable, from medical experts who felt able, within their expertise, to offer an opinion about the consistency of their findings with the asylum seekers' account. And the evidence of experts, in other words, need not be limited to the question of consistency uh, between the um, physical evidence uh, on, on the um, uh, claimant's body and the mechanism by which it had been sustained. It's, it's entirely proper for the expert to provide an opinion on consistency with the asylum seeker's account. And the Supreme Court held that as a matter of construction, um, paragraph 187c uh, of the Istanbul Protocol did not limit an expert's role as the Court of Appeal had indicated. So that's quite a um, helpful uh, clarification of the position, um, certainly for um, those making um, uh, claims on behalf of claimants in torture uh, related uh, cases. So the third case um, that I'm going to go 
uh, through is the um, appeal of the Secretary of State in Devani. And this is a case about um, what approach the tribunal should take um, where evidence is presented that seeks to rebut um, assurances made by a state as to prison conditions. For in, that's in the context of an Article 3 claim, uh, a claim that removal would be in breach of Article 3 because of the prison conditions. And the, the headline point is that the Court of Appeal emphasised that it's a very high threshold um, before such evidence can be taken to be capable of rebutting such state uh, assurances. So it was a successful case really from the Secretary of State's uh, opposition, successful appeal. So the background is that the claimant, Mr. Devani, was the subject of extradition of an extradition request by the Kenyan government. Um, this was challenged in the domestic courts um, pursuant to the um, statutory rights of, of challenge, um, ultimately unsuccessfully. Um, and the challenge was on the basis of um, the non-compliance of the prison conditions in Kenya with Article 3 of the ECHR. The Divisional Court in the extradition proceedings uh, found that the prison accepted the submission by the uh, claimant that the prison conditions in Kenya were indeed not Article 3 compliant, but formal assurances had been made by the um, Kenyan government, specifically by the Commissioner for Prisons um, and the Director of Public Prosecutions. Um, those assurances have been made to the Home Office that Article 3 um, compliant provision would be made, uh, detention provision would be made um, in the claimant's case. And on that basis, the Divisional Court dismissed the claimant's uh, extradition challenge. Subsequently, the claimant made an asylum and human rights claim on the basis of Article 3, um, relying essentially on the same point, but there was a further point that the claimant um, sought to rely on to um, take matters beyond uh, where they had got to in the extradition proceedings. This was um, the case of an earlier extradition uh, from the United Kingdom involving a Mr. Dea, um, who had been extradited to Kenya uh, on the basis uh, the lawfulness of that extradition uh, was, was upheld on the basis of equivalent assurances by the Kenyan um, go government. Um, Mr. Dea's case was uh, got um, quite a bit of uh, news coverage. He was extradited to Kenya to uh, face charges of child trafficking in connection with a miracle baby scam. And per the BBC, it, Mr. Dea claimed that he created miraculous pregnancies. Um, what Mr. Devani relied on was um, a single news story uh, which which drew principally on Mr. Dea's own account um, of his uh, prison conditions um, where he'd been detained after those assurances had been made. And that news story and the account that Mr. Dea gave in it indicated that the specific assurances made by the Kenyan government regarding the conditions in which he would be detained had not been followed through. The upper tribunal um, accepted that evidence essentially and accepted the uh, claimant's case on the basis of this new story. The Secretary of State appealed against that uh, determination to the Court of Appeal. And so the issue was, could an unverified news report, uh, to use the word of the, the wording of the Court of Appeal, constitute a sound basis to undermine the Kenyan assurances? The court um, found uh, and summarised the relevant principles um, from the case law, um, which I've set out there. I won't read them out, but essentially they um, indicate that it's a high threshold before the court will question the reliability of assurances in relation to prison conditions. And that's of a piece with the general approach of the judicial branch to um, those kind of statements by foreign um, executives. Ultimately, the Court of Appeal concluded that um, the appeal should be allowed and that it was uh, uh, erroneous for the upper tribunal to um, uh, uh, displace the Kenyan assurances on the basis of an unverified news report. Uh, uh, Lady Justice Nicola Davis noted that the report was based on no more than anecdotal evidence and the main source being a witness, uh, Mr. Dea, whose reliability was highly questionable. 
um, the news report um, uh, and, and, and Lady Justice Nicola Davis's um, view did not begin to prov provide the evidential weight required to undermine specific assurances given by senior office holders in Kenya. So that was the disposal of the main appeal. The case for Divine also raised a uh, procedural point arising from the fact that the first tier tribunal judge misrecorded the final decision. Now, you recall that Mr. Devani appealed to the tribunal. The judge actually accepted Mr. Devani's arguments in the first tier tribunal and intended to record in the notice of decision the following, the appeal is allowed, Article 3 only. Instead, the judge recorded the following words, the appeal is dismissed, um, Article 3 only. And that created something of a procedural um, swamp for the parties because uh, the claimant, on the basis of an upper tribunal decision in a case called Katsonga, uh, took the view that that error was beyond the slip rule. So you, you couldn't simply contact the first tier tribunal and ask them to correct that as an error. The Secretary of State couldn't appeal against the first tier tribunal decision because technically um, it was a successful party and took the view that uh, um, she would not file a response to uh, Mr. Devani's appeal. So in the upper tribunal, the claimant actually argued successfully that it was not open to the Secretary of State um, to argue the substantive point in the absence of the response and in view of the fact that the um, Secretary of State was a successful party. The Court of Appeal um, thought this was all um, a, a bit ridiculous and um, made, uh, the main point it made was that the slip rule did apply to such situations and it made that very clear and it set, it held that Katsonga, to the extent it um, indicated otherwise, was wrongly decided. There are also some um, helpful um, comments in the Court of Appeal about um, uh, responses uh, to appeals and the fact that they do have to be filed, uh, but that the tribunal retains the discretion to um, hear uh, a response, um, even when one is not filed. So there's quite a useful summary there of the position in relation to uh, those procedural points. So I've set out a summary there of the cases that I've been through. Um, oh, I'm out of time now, but for your information, there is um, a list of the cases um, uh, that I refer to uh, in outline at the start of my presentation um, and, and, and the main points that they've decided. So that, br that brings an end, uh, that brings to an end my summary of the case law. I'll now hand over to Alex. I think we're just waiting for Alex to unmute and then he'll be with us on machine learning. Great, thank you, Anna. Um, Fiona, can I just check that you can hear me now? Oh, Admas is nodding, excellent. Hello, everybody. My talk will be on machine learning and the future of asylum claims. The first I'll be talking about what machine learning is, um, if you don't, um, if you aren't aware, um, and then I'll talk about how it's being used uh, in the context of decision making, um, in particularly immigration decisions. Um, I'll then go on to machine learning in the context of asylum claims specifically, um, before rounding off with the, the sort of legal issues that we may have, and indeed which we're already seeing, um, regarding the use of this new technology. So machine learning is a subset um, of artificial intelligence and there's been a recent report which is very interesting, very interesting read um, by the UK uh, government on using artificial intelligence um, in the public sector and it's already being used quite a lot in a lot of different contexts. The UK government defines AI as the use of digital technology to create systems capable of performing tasks commonly thought to require um, intelligence, um, which you might think is a slightly circular definition. Um, but then it gives some useful examples. AI is constantly evolving, but generally it involves machines using statistics to find patterns in large amounts of data. It can perform repetitive tasks without the need for constant human guidance. And this is where uh, machine learning comes in um, as a subset of that broader category. So machine learning is effectively a way that digital systems can improve their performance at a given task over time um, through repetition, through the carrying out that task again and again and again 
working out what the right answer is, what the wrong answer is, and then becoming better um, at that task. Um, and in particular, it can be used um, to train um, algorithms to categorize data um, and spot patterns um, in large um, data sets. So it's very useful in a, in a wide variety of contexts. And um, we see it in facial recognition, where you feed loads and loads of pictures of faces um, into an algorithm in order to be able to spot um, what's the same per which picture shows the same person and which picture shows a different person. Speech to text translation. So if you're um, training your um, Alexa to recognize your voice and your particular um, verbal tics, that's an example of machine learning, driverless cars um, and fraud detection. Um, and it's this, this latter one that's come into play quite a lot in the context of public sector decision making. So in order to give you an example of how machine working, so machine learning works um, in practice, um, this is the interactive part of the session, um, it's sloth or pastry. Um, if you could just have a look at this grid and see which of these are sloths um, and which of them are pastries. Well, obviously um, all of them are pastries, uh, but a computer might not necessarily know that. So the way that we train um, a computer to distinguish between sloths and pastries um, is by giving it a simple task, put it into category A or category B, and we feed it 500 um, images um, of sloths or pastries, um, and then a human trainer uh, will effectively do the task um, himself or herself, um, and then we'll compare the figures. And the feedback for the computer is fed back into um, the algorithm, and then it does it again using different images and again and again. Um, and eventually um, the computer gets quite good um, at distinguishing between uh, which photos are sloths and which are pastries. Um, and that's just, just one example of how machine um, learning works in practice. Now you might, might be thinking that's all very interesting, Alex, but we're in an immigration um, seminar. How, how is this relevant to my practice? Um, well, it's, these kind of algorithms are already being used um, in, in the public sector um, and they're only set to increase um, in the future. The sort of public sector tasks these algorithms can help with um, include categorization. So again, a, a more detailed version of that simple task we saw earlier. Um, tailored public services. Um, so there's a medical applications here, potentially if you want to send um, an email reminder to get a checkup, say to um, men over 60, um, maybe it's an issue like on a bowel cancer or prostate cancer, um, you can feed your data set from your local doctors or hospital um, into the machine. The machine will tell you, you know, who's the, who's the most uh, high risk um, and then you know who to send the emails to for a, a targeted approach to public health alerts, for example. Um, and that, again, could be quite useful in the current COVID crisis um, as well with contact tracing, risk modelling, you know, finding which kinds of people are more likely to be affected. Um, and it, using a computer to do this effectively means that you don't have to spend so much time uh, uh, on, on a task with a, a human doing the same thing. It can really sort of uh, make the task a lot quicker um, and a lot cheaper as well in terms of time. Um, data entry um, as well is just another example of that. The controversial, that all seems fine. The controversial part comes when we start using these algorithms to help um, with decision making, um, where we have a sort of categorization task initially as the first part of the decision, um, and then the human takes over, or indeed uh, the human making a decision with the assistance um, of AI, which seems to be the direction we're going. Um, and I note as well, AI systems are being used with um, automated decision making in the sense of DVLA, knowing which um, sort of fraudulent MOT testers to target. It's been proven to save a lot of time in that context. Um, local councils of identifying um, fraudulent benefit claimants, uh, the Home Office, um, in a case I'll get to in a second, um, and the National um, Crime Agency um, as well in identifying um, uh, victims um, of abuse in large amounts of um, pictures, for example. So onto the Home Office. Uh, the Home Office has created one of these uh, sort of machine learning tools um, that is contributing to immigration policy decisions um, in respect of visa um, applications at the moment. And what this tool does, it allocates applicants to uh, one of three um, risk categories um, based on a number of um, factors. Um, and then uh, depending on which risk category someone's um, put into, uh, a, amount of, a certain amount of scrutiny is applied uh, by a human caseworker. Um, and we'll, we'll get onto the sort of the legal issues of that in a sec, but there, are, there should be obvious um, red flags to that kind of approach. Um, but it's something the Home Office are doing and they're currently defending um, a legal challenge to that at the moment. 
they're also using um, an AI tool to cross-reference data uh, between themselves and other um, government departments um, to verify residents within the settled status application process as well. So we're seeing that whenever there's an immigration innovation coming in, there's often um, AI is being um, sort of tagged onto it or explored um, in that context um, at the moment. How can machine learning help us um, with asylum decisions? Well, there's an interesting 2017 study by two academics, Chen and Eagle. Uh, they created a machine learning algorithm to classify uh, asylum applications um, into two categories, you know, binary decision, grant of asylum or no grant of asylum. So again, it's sort of like the, um, the, the, the task we saw earlier, you know, which of these uh, two categories does this particular applicant fall into? And the algorithm analyzed um, just under 500,000 um, asylum hearings, 336 different locations, um, just under 500 judges um, over a 30 year period. Um, and by um, training the algorithm um, through the same process that I described earlier, the algorithm was able to correctly classify 82% of the asylum decisions into the decision category, grant of asylum or not grant of asylum, uh, that was actually reached. And they said, we've shown that through a complex nonlinear learning system, we can predict with a high degree of accuracy whether an asylum applicant uh, would be granted refugee status. Now, that is a, a potentially a very useful tool. Um, and for, for those of us who are lawyers who um, ad advise on prospects, it's potentially quite a worrying tool um, because applications um, for um, advising clients, the, the applications for advising clients are, are potentially quite, quite large. You, you wouldn't have to go to a barrister, perhaps junior barrister like myself in the future. You could just feed your data um, into one of these um, uh, algorithms and the algorithm will be able to determine with a high degree of accuracy whether it's a, a strong case or not such a strong case. Um, but there are potentially quite um, worrying uh, aspects to this as well from the point of view of assisting decision making. Um, you, could, you can well envisage um, a future where an initial examination of a case was done by an algorithm and then perhaps it was just checked by a human checker um, or, or case worker um, on the basis that well this is very accurate and if the human did it would reach the same route. Um, result anyway. There are a number of countries, I think Switzerland as well actually, but Canada and Germany are known um, to be experimenting with algorithmic decision making um, in the immigration field at the moment. Um, Canada um, has been developing what's called a, a predictive um, analytics system, so that's using um, these tools to predict patterns in large data sets to um, automate certain activities conducted um, by immigration officials, but it's all a bit hush-hush. Um, um, what they've also been doing since 2018 um, is um, sort of like what's happening with the Home Office here. They've been sort of streamlining um, applications, um, but in their case, they're streamlining it into a complex case category um, or a simple case category. So you could say in that case, the algorithm isn't helping the, with a substantive decision. It was, it's merely helping in identifying which cases are likely to be more complicated um, and, and which aren't. So there's perhaps a distinction there that we can draw between using AI to help in that sense um, and using um, AI to, uh, to help with a substantive decision. And uh, as I said earlier, you, you can well imagine some, some problems once the uh, AI system starts um, assisting us with the substantive decision. So what are the potential legal issues of using um, algorithms with, to help us with decision making. Um, the main issue is um, discrimination, um, actually, and it's it's very easy for these algorithms to discriminate if they're basically left unchecked and left to make decisions um, without human oversight. Um, for example, if they're determining who's a, a fraud risk for the purposes um, of awarding benefits, and there's um there's two real ways in which they can be biased. Um, they can be trained using skewed information. So that the people who, who create a, a, a case, case bundle have, for example, or a summary of a case, have their own inherent biases um, and humans, you know, all this data ultimately comes from humans. Humans have their own inherent biases as well. And if you feed biased information um, into, into an algorithm, then the algorithm um, is potentially going to become biased as well. Um, you see that uh, potentially with um, facial recognition software. Facial recognition software is very good at detecting uh, white faces, not very good at uh, detecting um, or di distinguishing between 
um, black or Asian faces. Similarly, the sort of technology that's used um, to program driverless cars um, at the moment, um, it's very good um, at spotting um, a white person crossing the road and distinguishing between um, a white person um, and say um, a leaf. Um, very, it, it struggles to distinguish um, between a black person and a leaf and therefore these uh, cars at the moment are more likely to hit a black person than a white person. They wonder what, what does that happen? Well partly it's because the data set that's entered in um, is biased from the start because a lot of the researchers um, in the sort of um, the parks where they conduct tests um, tend to be white so and you grab the nearest person to test your driverless car if it's a, a white person in that working environment um, then most of the data that the driverless car um, system is receiving is um, you know is, is, is uh, white people crossing a road um, so you can see there as just one example of how if you don't program these algorithms very carefully you can end up with the same sort of biases uh, that you get if a human um, is to make um, a decision um, and I know as well on this slide there's a such a um, algorithmic uh, decision-making device was used by Central Bedfordshire um, Council to determine, you know, who's a potential fraud risk for the allocation of benefits. And um, I think since 2012, councils have been able to use these kinds of um, automated systems um, to um, to basically set up risk categories for um, potential fraud. Uh, random sample of 10 high-risk applicants. Um, they were all working women. Now, I'm not suggesting that is necessarily biased, but it's slightly worrying um, that. Again and again, might point to um, certain safeguards that need to be put in place when using these um, uh, sorts of systems. Um, otherwise, we end up with um, the, the very sort of biased decision making we're trying to um, take out of the system um, when, when a human's making the decision. In the immigration context, um, there's a, a legal challenge that um, I think was just brought the other day, actually, by um, JCWI. Um, there's a, a challenge to the Home Office's visa streaming tool, which I referred to earlier, um, because it uses nationality as a risk factor. So the Home Office has this unpublished list um, of high-risk countries, which it uses to help the, um, the AI uh, system um, distinguish between which of these cases um, these visa application cases need further scrutiny um, and which ones don't um, and whenever I, I hear the word sort of secret list um, as a sort of lawyer always a bit hmm um, about that. Um, the allegation in that case is that it's no different to the Roma rights um, case where Roma applications um, from um, Czech Republic were being treated with increased scrutiny uh, because Romas were deemed uh, to be higher risk so it doesn't matter if you use a higher risk um, if you're saying it's always just a higher risk category, um, it's still discrimination if that, you know, it affects certain groups in an unjustified um, way. It'd be interesting to see um, how the High Court grapple uh, with machine learning. I did a quick check on Westlaw for uh, sort of machine learning and AI um, yesterday to see if there's anything um, interesting for this presentation, but it's all patent cases really. The um, uh, courts haven't really grappled and with it, yeah, there's perhaps a little bit of it in Privacy International, but the Supreme Court just, did, just didn't touch it at all. So very interested to see um, how the courts deal with this in this uh, sort of AI test case. Another issue is, is the fact that decision making, if you hand it over uh, to algorithms, decision making becomes very opaque. It's very hard to work out how a decision has actually been re released, so reached, if half of the decision or indeed all of the decision um, has been reached through a opaque algorithm, which um, one, it's very difficult to understand, um, sort of, uh, I think it's described as sort of black box decision making, um, but also there's potential um, uh, copyright, commercial confidentiality um, issues, disclosure issues, where if your procurement contract says you're not allowed to disclose what, how this algorithm works, because, you know, if you're, I know, say Apple and then Google don't want you to uh, see what it is, then potentially um, it's going to be quite difficult to, you know, launch a judicial review if you don't have the information and aren't going to be able to understand the information even if you get it. And yeah, so this next slide is effectively the same thing. The House of, Ar House of Lords AI Committee said the number and complexity of stages involved in these deep learning systems is often such that even our developers can't even be sure which factors led to a system to decide things one way or another. Um, when I worked for the Law Commission, we interviewed someone at Oxbotica who designs driverless cars, um, and partly because we we're interested in, in how we can, you know, potentially have a new form of uh, corporate manslaughter if, if one of these cars kills someone. Um, and he put up his hands and said, look, I don't know how the system works. I feed data in, I give it 
a stir effectively, a data comes out, I don't actually know if a car swerves and kills someone, how it reached that decision. Um, and so there's, even if even the developers don't fully understand um, how these uh, systems work, there's potentially going to be a bit of difficulty when it comes to uh, reviewing decisions that are made with the assistance um, of these systems. So, it, you know, I hope I haven't painted a, a sort of bleak post-apocalyptic robot future um, for us all, but there are ways around this, I hope, um, and there are potential things to think about in respect to future challenges. Um, one solution might be a quality audit, auditing of data sets and algorithm design. So giving a, a thorough review of an algorithm before using it um, for things as, such as an inherent bias, almost a form of inherent bias training um, for algorithms um, might be one way to um, avoid the potential errors that we're just trying to get out of on the human side. And we don't want to be you know, thrown back into them at the deep end on the, um, the AI side. Um, again, greater transparency regarding when decisions are made um, using um, AI assistance. You know, if you get a, uh, an immigration decision, if it was to say on that immigration decision, this has been reached with the assistance of AI in you know, X, Y, Z ways, that might be one way towards increasing um, transparency. Um, similarly with government procurement contracts, often these are very expensive systems initially, even though they'll save a lot of money later. So there's a, a sort of a, usually a government procurement exercise. Um, there might be something in respect of government contracts, um, standard transparency clauses, accountability clauses, um, so or, or something to do, you know to do with disclosure, so that um, when it comes to uh, a challenge, uh, we're not left in the dark. And finally, I think it's important to ring fence certain decisions from being made in a fully automated way at all. Um, and interestingly, um, GDPR, Article 22, has that built in. Um, it says the data subject shall have the right not to be a subject of a decision based solely on automated processing, including profiling, which produces legal effects concerning him or her, or similarly significant, significant effects, significantly affects him or her. So we're starting to see now at a European level, uh, the right to have a human decision maker in respect of decisions that affect you. Um, and that's something that perhaps um, we should think about um, domestically um, before uh, the, the robots take over. Um, right, that's the end of my presentation. So I'm now going to pass you on to um, Fiona and Chris Jacobs. Um, thank you very much, Alex. That was a very thought provoking talk. We now pass over to Chris, um, who's going to talk to us about Article 31. Thank you. 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 Yes, hello. I'm going to talk about Article 31 of the Refugee Convention. Um, and um, uh, I'm not actually able to um, access my slides, I'm afraid, Fiona. I don't know whether there's anything to be done about that. Um, yes, here we are. So um, uh, there was a case um, on this point um, which um, raised um, an interesting issue as to whether um, Article 31 um, had been uh, properly interpreted and properly applied uh, by the courts. Um, that case was SE versus the Secretary of State. Um, I was instructed in that case and um, um, it was to have been heard on the 29th of January 2020. Uh, prior to um, the um, hearing of that uh, judicial review um, substantive application, the respondent uh, conceded um, the uh, proceedings. Um, at, but the point of public importance um, remains. Uh, we were able to obtain um, a, an expert report um, from uh, Professor um, Good, Goodwin Gill, um, who stated um, that really in, in his issue, in, in his view, um, the uh, Article 31 didn't apply just to prosecution, criminal or uh, penal sanctions but uh, to incidental sanctions and uh, disadvantages that were caused uh, by uh, irregular uh, entry or presence or linked to such irregular entry or presence. So let's look at what Article 31 of the Refugee Convention says. 
um, the, contract, the um, contracting states um, shall not impose penalties um, on account of the entry or presence, uh, oh, sorry, sorry, on account of their illegal entry or presence on refugees who coming directly from a territory where their life or freedom is threatened in the sense of Article 1, enter or are present in their territory without authorization, uh, provided they present themselves without delay to the authorities and show good cause for their illegal entry or um, presence. Um, coming directly from a territory um, has been the um, subject of some attention by the courts and the courts have held that if you're in a, a, a third country uh, en route to the United Kingdom, en route to a country called asylum, um, um, and it's just a stopover, then um, that doesn't count. And it's arguable that it wouldn't count if the third country is a country that is not, or was not at the right time, a signatory um, to uh, the convention. But what um, is a, a live issue um, in light of um, SE is really um, what is the meaning of a penalty? Does it just apply to what happened upon entry or is it the continuing um, uh, I, I, idea? So um, the case of ASPOR um, looked at um, what were the aims uh, of the Refugee Convention and Lord Bingham at paragraph nine of the judgment identified three broad humanitarian aims. And you can see I've highlighted the third aim, um, which says that broadly expressed, it was to protect refugees from the imposition of criminal penalties for breaches of the law reasonably or necessarily committed uh, in the course of flight uh, from persecution or threatened persecution. And in the following paragraph, paragraph 10 of the judgment, which I haven't highlighted here, um, it was accepted that Article 31 of the Refugee Convention gives effect um, to that third uh, broad humanitarian aim. Um, Section 31 of the uh, Immigration and Asylum Act um, was um, implemented uh, after the case of Adimi, in which it was very clear that prosecuting authorities were simply not having any regard to Article 31 at all, and refugees who arrived in the United Kingdom on false papers were prosecuted, uh, and, and the humanitarian aims of the Convention and the Convention itself um, hadn't been considered. So there's a refugee defence um, which is available to all who are charged to say uh, I was uh, arriving on false doc documents as a consequence of my asylum application and that um, ought to succeed in the vast majority of cases. Um, so moving on, um, let's make sure I've got, here we are. Um, it's also possible for um, refugees um, to uh, seek to have their convictions reviewed or quashed um, and um, refugees have been entitled to apply to the uh, Criminal Cases Review Commission uh, to review their, commission for, to their convictions for irregular entry or stay. And there was a case in the Court of Appeal uh, called Nori, the citation of that is uh, 2016 EWCA, CRIM 18, and um, in that case the Court of Appeal indicated that the court um, had sufficient knowledge of cases um, such that, um, that, 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 that it should have um, a, a direct referral made to it. But unfortunately, that doesn't always assist refugees. And there has been a, a degree of research, perhaps most importantly, research from Halliday in 2019 uh, and, and others, that says that um, refugees don't always seek to um, quash their convictions. There are often feelings of shame and stigma associated with having uh, been uh, convicted and, and um, uh, gone to uh, prison perhaps. Um, there are um, uh, often insufficient um, resources available um, or advisors to assist um, in respect of overturning a conviction. It may be several years later, uh, relevant papers may have been lost, the court may um, have disposed of the file. So there could be numerous reasons um, why um, uh, individuals don't go to the Court of Appeal. Very often they will perhaps decide um, to, to get on with their refugee claim. That's the most important uh, thing to them and, and that's probably um, always going to be a priority where they have a well-founded fear um, of um, 
persecution. So, so this um, ability to have a conviction uh, reviewed or overturned or quashed um, doesn't necessarily um, result in refugees who were not advised at the time of the um, refugee defence and ha have convictions. It doesn't always result in them um, actually uh, making applications to um, quash those convictions. Um, so, um, so we need to look then um, at um, the immigration rules. Um, uh, and part of um, what was being argued in SE was that those rules themselves um, are, um, are, are, are ultra-virus. And um, the way that the rules um, work or have operated, excuse me, um, is to require <coughs> the Secretary of State when someone makes an application um, for indefinite leave to remain, to refuse that application in circumstances where that individual has um, a conviction. So if we go to um, paragraph 339R, and this was the uh, uh, provision that was being considered in the case of um, uh, um, SE, um, requirements for indefinite leave for purposes granted refugee status or humanitarian protection. We can see what the requirements are. And then moving um, through, um, if the applicant, um, if, if, um, there's a condition whether the uh, applicant has been convicted of an offence for which they've been sentenced to imprisonment of at least 12 months, but not less than four years, and there's a period of 15 years has passed since the end of that sentence. And if that applies, if you've had a conviction and a sentence of imprisonment between 12 months and uh, less than four years, then um, rule um, 339T uh, applies, um, and which states indefinite leave uh, for a person granted refugee status or humanitarian is to be refused if any of the requirements of paragraph 339R uh, are, are not met. So there's a mandatory refusal if you have an outstanding conviction. And the rules do not provide for any, uh, any, any discretion to um, uh, rely on the um, circumstances. So an individual who uh, claimed refugee status, uh, obtained a conviction to which Article 31 applied, did not rely on the Section 39 defence, did not seek to or was, or was, was unable to um, overturn or quash the conviction, cannot be settled in the United Kingdom uh, for, for 15 years. And what we say is that that breaches, or what was being said um, in the uh, case of SE, is that that breaches Section 2 of the Asylum and Immigration Appeals Act. Nothing in the rules within the Human Immigration Act seems to shall lay down a practice which would be contrary to the Convention. And um, it's strongly arguable that this um, right to settle constitutes a penalty for the purposes of Article 31. Um, it's the UNHCR view um, that um, penalties uh, don't only include prosecution, fine and imprisonment. Um, and other jurisdictions, um, certainly those who instruct me were able to, uh, to uh, and, and, and the legal team, were able to locate examples of other jurisdictions that refer to administrative penalties, not just um, criminal um, sanctions. So there is support from other jurisdictions for a wider uh, interpretation of Article 31. And of course, talking about Article 31, this is a, 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 a talk in which the number 31 appears quite a lot. We have articles, we have the article of the Refugee Convention, we have the section uh, that gives the uh, um, criminal defence, and now we have the Vienna Convention. And uh, that states a treaty shall be interpreted in good faith in accordance with the ordinary meaning to be given to the terms of the treaty in their context and in light of its object and purposes. And the object and purpose of the Refugee Convention, when one looks at the, uh, the drafting of that um, instrument um, is to uh, protect refugees from all penalties, um, not just criminal sanctions arising um, at the point and immediately after the point um, of um, arrival. So um, what um, conclusions 
um, then um, can be drawn. Um, I'm afraid I'm having some technical difficulties here. Um, the, the conclusions that can be drawn um, from this um, are that penalties must be understood in a wider sense that includes the right to settle. Um, Article 31 shouldn't relate to the period immediately after arrival. And the scope and meaning of that article must be considered in light of the objects and purposes of the Convention. And as matters stand, the uh, rules uh, are arguably ultra virus. So um, there will no doubt be um, applications from individuals with criminal convictions that, are, that haven't been overturned or quashed that are related uh, to um, what happened when they applied for refugee status. And if um, these immigration rules are applied, um, I, I would argue that um, there should be a challenge in that regard. So I think I've um, run out of time and that's all I have to say for now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Now we've had some very interesting questions. Could I ask Alex and Admas to also um, unmute themselves and uh, turn their cameras on so we can see everyone's faces. We've had some very interesting questions. Um, the first one of these, Alex, is I'm going to address to you, which is how do you know at the moment if the Home Office have been using or haven't been using um, the uh, automated intelligence systems? That's a question from an individual because they won't tell you in the Home Office refusal letters. Um, I mean, the immediate, my immediate thought, Alex, was that that's something that you can ask by way of a Freedom of Information Act request, um, because they would be under an obligation to tell you. But I don't know whether you have any direct experience of that happening at the moment. I can't say I have any direct experience, Fiona. Um, I agree it's a bit uh, opaque at the moment, uh, and unless there are clues in the decision itself um, or subject access request, um, then we may struggle to know. Um, I think probably the best way to think about this at the moment in terms of what we as lawyers can do is to think about potential systemic challenges um, to the use of them as a whole. Um, and part of that is sort of being abreast on the information that comes out regarding the use of them. So if we know that information is being used uh, in a certain way um, through the, the media or the, or the news, etc., cetera, um, then we might think about how our, how our clients individual claimants might fit in there and whether we can incorporate their claims um, into a more uh, systemic um, challenge and um, which is what's being being done at the moment yeah obviously the jcwi challenge is doing that but i mean i could foresee that i mean the government unless there was issues around commercial confidentiality which might stop them identifying how exactly what the algorithm is should it seems to me in principle in response to an foi request um, respond to that and say yes we are using artificial intelligence in this type of decision making um, and certainly I think um, there would be various situations in which they would have to tell you I would assuming that those that those decisions are being made in that way if it became widespread more than just data sorting into actually making decisions yeah, given, so given what the GDPR says yeah, certainly. Um, and just on your um, commercial confidentiality point, that's clearly important in judicial review, but uh, it can't be a trump card. And I think in terms of the disclosure test, um, Tweed and Parades Com Commission, um, the government can certainly um, cite commercial confidentiality, but ultimately it's about the interests of justice. And if we need to know how these systems work as part of an individual challenge, then I think a, a judge is um, unlikely um, to, to be persuaded that nothing about it can, can be disclosed. Um, and also there are ways around it as well under the, the duty of candor, you don't have to disclose everything. So it might be that a redacted data set or a fair summary of how the scheme operates might be um, a suitable way around potential um, commercial confidentiality concerns. Yeah, I mean, certainly in, in a slightly different area, but when I've done procurement work, you often have a confidentiality ring. So you have the people who know <laughs> about the commercially confidential information. You have a couple of people from each of the parties who are allowed to see and analyse it. But one of the difficulties is, is that are we at risk of running into the similar problems that then led to the financial crash in 2008, in that the people who are overseeing the system don't really understand how the system works? 
one of the reasons that the crash happened was because people on the boards of large financial institutions didn't understand the products that were being sold and the algorithms which underlay that. Surely that's a difficulty that we don't, we don't have enough expertise and experience as lay people, which we are in this context, to be able to intelligently work out whether or not the algorithm is discriminatory or isn't. I mean, how does how does that work in practice? Um, well, in practice, this this is an issue that um, you know that I think the law really needs to catch up with um, at the moment because sort of advances in AI are moving um, so quickly that we're one, one step behind. Um, all I can say is that is that you know during the during my time at the Law Commission when we looked at this specific issue in respect of driverless cars, um, there's really no criminal framework for dealing with an instance where a an AI system goes wrong and then a you know driverless car goes and and crashes someone. So we're looking at you know potential ways of vicarious liability. Um, there's certain liability attached to dangerous um, animals, for example, where it's almost like a strict liability offence. So if there's any way to incorporate that, in, yeah, to incorporate that into judicial review somehow, where the book start, stops with a human, even if the human doesn't fully understand how it works. But I think that will probably need some some careful thought from politicians and some legislative change, I imagine. But I, I agree, there's no. no easy way to deal with it at the moment and don't politicians and others also need to understand how the algorithm works in order to determine whether or not it's discriminatory because unless you understand what's going into the system you can't understand what's coming out of it and yeah. many of us don't have enough it abilities or not that it should be perfectly possible to describe what's going on in fairly simplistic terms but i'm not always sure that that's what happens before this sort of ai gets commissioned Do, can you enlighten us at all alec um what i can say is that from, from the people who, who build these things that i've spoken to often they don't know how it how it works on a kind of granular sort of level because it's, it's almost like when, once a, a certain level of intelligence has been reached it's almost like training an animal really and you can know that the animal is going to if you train it a certain way it's not going to bite people or it's not going to do something that you don't want it to but when it suddenly does it you don't actually know what the reason is um behind it uh but so so i think some some kind of sort of strict liability type thing i know if with product liability for example you don't have to know exactly how uh, a product went wrong if it's like a toaster to explode you just have to know that the toaster exploded toaster shouldn't explode um, therefore whoever designed the toaster we don't have to investigate why it is but we just know that it did so something's gone uh, gone gone wrong here so something like that but how you incorporate that from the civil law side into public law proceedings i think is is a it's a difficult question i don't i don't have an easy answer to that i'm afraid okay that's very helpful alex Admas and Chris, if I could turn to the two of you, we've got a couple of other questions. We've got one question about social media activity as surplus activity. For those people who aren't as experienced in um, asylum and immigration claims, surplus activity is activity which takes place outside of the country which one is fleeing. So the obvious example of which would be demonstrating in London outside uh, an embassy. Zimbabwe is an obvious one I can think of, or Iran, and that being a reason why you either shouldn't be returned to the country or why you could seek refugee status, because the likelihood is, is you would be persecuted if you were returned. So in particular, we've got a question from someone about cases in relation to Iran, where the Home Office are saying that surplus activities on Facebook can be deleted and therefore the fact that you can demonstrate that you're undertaking surplus activities on social media on Facebook but I suspect the others doesn't really matter because they can be deleted. Admas, what's your view about that? Um, well I think um, that would turn and that would turn on the um, extent of the surplus um, activity yes. that's going on. It's, it's an it's a it's an evidential question really isn't it so it's it's going to be quite context specific um but it's, it's just going to depend on the extent and degree of the activity and and also when it can be deleted because it depends if one posts something mildly critical of the iranian regime once and then deletes it 24 hours later the likelihood of the iranian regime in fact seeing it is unclear if one however, is a high-profile activist against, let's use the Iranian regime, but it could be any other regime, and one is 
Facebooking and tweeting and performing lots of social media activities online over a number of months, the fact that one can delete it in the future doesn't stop that activity having not been taken notice of by the relevant authorities. So it would seem to me it's a question of fact and degree. And the fact you can delete it, I mean, that's a bit like saying I can take a book out of circulation. Yeah. If I'm thinking about old old fashioned <laughs> ways of doing things, the fact that you can take a book out of circulation doesn't mean that the book no longer exists. And I think with Facebook, you can obviously screenshot anything, can't you? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then we've also got another question about Iranian cases. Right. Like, Chris, do you have anything yes. else you want to say about that? Yes, I, I think um, it's 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 always difficult in um, social media cases. Um, it depends on the country that's involved. Certainly in Sudan, the you know, security service before the old regime fell um, had a special department devoted to monitoring the diaspora in the United Kingdom. Um, and I was involved in an Iranian case once where a member of parliament read out and named her constituent, who was my client, and that led to a whole claim. If, if it can be established that the Iranian authorities are interested in monitoring the diaspora, um, if the um, Facebook message isn't immediately deleted, um, then in my view, um, because there's only uh, a low standard of proof, reasonable degree of likelihood, um, I think one would have to look at the country, look at whether that is a country where there are numerous surplus claims and Iran is such a country. So I think that the Secretary of State's position on that, whereas if it's just one tweet that was, you know, obscure, um, not particularly clear, deleted immediately, um, that's one case. But in the majority of cases, um, social media, political statements would form the basis of a good surplus claim. Yeah. We've got another case, um, uh, uh, question from somebody else. Again, asking about the situation in Iran. Uh, which is the Secretary of State for the Home Department drawing adverse credibility findings uh, against somebody in respect of an asylum claim on the basis that someone who attended an anti-government demonstration in Iran ought to have known of the potential repercussions of, uh, of attending such a demonstration. Admas, if I can turn to you first and then to Chris for your response to this. Um, I think Drawing adverse um, credibility um, inference from that, I mean, it's, it seems to me a bit tricky. I don't know what the uh, there's a specific situation that the writer had in mind, um, but again, it's it's quite a it's it's a fact specific point, isn't it? So if somebody is aware, I mean, people go people. Uh, go on demonstrations and undertake um, political activities in the full knowledge that there is a, a, a risk to them, but that, that can quite easily be evidence of the extent of their commitment to those to those ideas. That's certainly one way um, in which it can be presented. Um, I don't see I don't see that it's necessarily or even obviously a basis on which you could draw an adverse um, cre um, inference credibility. I don't know what Chris thinks about that. I mean, I tend to agree with you, Abbas. I can't see how, I mean, surely that sort of peaceful political protest is exactly what a large part of the refugee, you know, disproportionate responses to that is exactly the sort of things that the refugee convention was designed for. And yes, designed blaming, for blaming the applicant for the... Uh, yeah, blaming the person for going on the demonstration rather yeah. than blaming the government for then locking them up for going on the demonstration or threatening to lock them up because obviously in lots of these cases it's not necessarily about what has happened but what might happen if there's a risk of return. Chris? Well, um, the, the Secretary of State, you know, um, I think has, has got it wrong. Um, there's a, a long-standing case called Damien, Damien um, and in that case someone manufactured their own political asylum application um, um, from nothing, um, purely with the objective um, of um, uh, creating a well-founded fear of persecution in this country of origin. And what the court held in that case is it doesn't matter what the motivation of the individual is. If you go on a demonstration and you're going on a demonstration when you, you know that it's likely that you could be in trouble in this 
space um, uh, is, it, is the perception of the authority. Do you have that? It's, it's, it's about a, sub, a subjective fear and an objective fear. And if the authority is perceived, you don't, in an imputed political opinion, will engage the refugee convention, regardless of whether you, um, you know, created it or manufactured a risk or, or, or acted in a way that um, um, uh, you know, draws attention to yourself. If the effect of that is that the authorities see you as a risk and that you do have on the low standard of proof a well-founded fear of persecution, if you attend a demonstration and, it, and the perception of the authorities is that that puts you at risk, then you're entitled to succeed in your claim. I, I, I don't think that, um, that, 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 that that really ought properly to, to be the basis of a credibility point. Um, thank you. I think that's very helpful. Somebody's asked um, what the name of the case was. What we'll do, Chris, is after the um, after this is over, we will write. We will do a little summary that we'll send to everybody who attended of the um, question and answer session, so we can put up the citations to the cases, Chris, that you've just identified. The case of Damien, I believe, was the case that you mentioned. Yes. Um, Admas, um, can we now turn, I just wanted to ask you a question about Mr. Dayer. I mean, I think that um, fundamentally when it comes to Mr. Dayer's credibility with the case you were dealing with in respect of the reassurance to Kenya, you were probably right as Mr. Dayer, I mean, literally, you know, convinced women that they were actually giving birth. Yeah. Um, when they weren't and he was in fact buying babies from uh, the orphanage down the road. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of that. So I think Mr. Dayer's credibility is somewhat shot to pieces on the facts of that case. But does it, but then, but it would seem to me that there would be circumstances in which unverified accounts, particularly if they came from sources like Amnesty International or other bodies like that, even if they weren't entirely verified, would be something that should at the very least be taken into account. Because obviously it's always in the third party government's best interest to say that the conditions don't apply. And yeah. it's often very difficult to get access to that unless you've got the UN or the Red Cross or somebody who's able to go in. There are all sorts of ways and means of stopping that. Yeah. But potentially that case is an unhelpful example. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because of the nature of Mr. Dayer's notoriety, should we put it that way? Yeah, I would, I would, I would uh, completely agree with that. It's, um, it was a very low um, uh, uh, level of credibility and um, and cogency of evidence. Uh, the it was, it was, it was, it was essentially all Mr. Dayer's own account, and um, his, his, the fact that he had his credibility was shot. Essentially, was um, um, a serious factor. I think something more. Um, substantive. I think the the it's it's said that the evidence must uh, possess special force is the the test that's given. Uh, but something like a report from Amnesty or the Red Cross or Human Rights Watch, I think that would be um, something that the courts would consider very seriously. And 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 certainly, I, it seems to me that would be the basis on which a tribunal would be entitled to um, displace um, assurances made um, by the state. So it's a very fact. I agree. It's a very fact-specific um, decision. Yeah, it's just slightly worrying in in that it might lead people to, to adopt a more cautious approach than maybe they should do in those sorts of cases, um, on the basis of just reading the headpiece rather than reading yeah. through yeah. the evidence. Yeah. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is in respect of the Sri Lankan case. It would seem to me that had the Court of Appeals decision have been followed um, in the immigration, the immigration case about torture, that would have led to all sorts of problems in all sorts of civil cases. I think I was thinking in particular about family cases where you have expert paediatricians saying all the time the account given is consistent or not consistent with the account of the claimant when it comes to injuries to babies and small children or is it possible that somebody fell off the sofa or didn't so the idea of a medical clinician not being able to say whether something was whether a clinical injury was or wasn't credible with someone's account significant 
repercussion, not just in the field of immigration, but more generally in terms of findings where clinical expertise is required. Would you agree? Yeah, I would. I would agree with that. I think um, the it's, it's it's always going to be an element of judgment um, from the tribunal side where. Um, and a clinical expert um, offers a, go, goes beyond offering a view on um, the specific uh, thing that leads to the injuries or, or whatever's on the consideration. So in the case of torture, where the clinician moves beyond the specific mechanism that's said to cause the torture to something a little broader, such as the, the, the overall case. But I think the, the, the point of the Supreme Court's um, decision is essentially that that's all a matter for the tribunal, whereas the Court of Appeal was... Um, I think seeking to lay down a kind of more of a um, hard line rule uh, to constrain what an expert can say. Um, I think I think it's a sensible um, decision, and it allows courts and tribunals the flexibility to take a view um, on that evidence and uh, and, yeah. and and how to deal with it. Yeah, because I know certainly in respect to Sri Lankan cases, there's been well jurisprudence going back years now about medical torture reports because it's a it's the most common ground upon which asylum claims are made from that particular country. And we yeah. have a large number of asylum claims in Sri Lanka. Yeah. Um, right. I don't think we have any other questions. Chris, Admas, Alex, do you have any other observations? I just wanted to say, um, I think very helpfully, provided the citation of the case I referred to, it's 2000. IMMAR 96, that's the Immigration Appeal Court, and it's Danian. And um, I see that uh, Margaret is, is here, and it was her case. So, Well, th thank you, Chris, for that. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, just to remind you that this seminar, this webinar, sorry, does qualify for an hour and 25 minutes worth of your continuing professional development. Thank you very much for listening to us so patiently. Um, please do provide us with feedback and we look forward to um, seeing you very soon, hopefully in person rather than over Zoom. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Bye bye.